Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Now, my class, you will learn to think for yourselves again. You will learn to savor words and language. No matter what anybody tells you, words and ideas can change the world. Hey Adapters, welcome back to another episode of America Adapts. In this show, I am joined by Professor Elizabeth Rush, author and lecturer at Brown University. Elizabeth and I discuss the role of creative nonfiction in helping to explain the threat of climate change and what we can do to adapt. We also discuss the emerging genre of cli-fi, the important role of narrative structure in science writing, and also Elizabeth shares how she wrote her dad's story into an amazing adaptation metaphor. This was really a fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. First, though, I want to report back on my recent journey to California. I just spent eight days traveling up and down the state interviewing people for my upcoming three-part episode arc, California Adapts. This series is produced with Randy Olson, a semi-regular on the podcast. I'm being sponsored by UCLA's Institute of the Environment to develop the series. I am incredibly excited to share what I learned. It's a bit different than what I've done in the past. I can't begin to describe what an exciting trip it was. I conducted over 15 interviews with experts from UCLA's Institute of the Environment, state officials dealing with drought and flooding. I also did some people on the street interviews in Hollywood's Farmer's Market. And what was really cool, I visited the home of actor and environmental activist Ed Begley Jr. and learned about California's own environmental history. That amazing interview was followed by a visit to one of the recent wildfire burns in Ventura County where local fire captain Tony McHale walked us through burned and ashen terrain to explain what it was like to fight these fires firsthand. This whole journey ended at the Santa Cruz Lighthouse, where I spoke with Gary Griggs of UC Santa Cruz, a legend in sea level rise circles. Blue skies, surfers, and waves splashing made for an amazing backdrop. And most exciting, California Adapts will premiere during a science panel hosted by Randy Olson and Jade Lovell, at the South by Southwest Festival in Austin, Texas in early March. I'll likely have a couple more episodes before the premiere of California Adapts, so you'll be hearing more about it in the coming month. Okay, just a reminder, America Adapts is a charitable organization that needs your support. Please consider giving a tax-deductible donation. You can find links to the Flip Cause donate page in the show notes. And to those who have already donated, thank you. Also, if you are interested in sponsoring a specific podcast like I'm doing for California Daps or having me speak at public or corporate events, please contact me at americadaps at gmail.com. Finally, upcoming guests include Dan Ash, former director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Dan is great, and he'll also talk about his current role as the executive director of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. All right, adapters, it's your favorite part of the podcast. Let's get this started. Hey, welcome back, Adapters. On today's episode, I am excited to be hosting author and visiting lecturer in English at Brown University, Professor Elizabeth Rush. Hi, Elizabeth. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. I've been really excited to get you on. I, I usually really prep the day or two before the podcast. It's just how it is when I research my guests. And I think you're doing some really cool things with the, the writing that you're doing. And so you're at Brown. You're a visiting lecturer. So what do you do there exactly? I teach creative nonfiction. So I'm in the English department and all of the classes I teach are workshop based. So that means that students come in. Um, I often will give one craft lecture a week talking about different aspects of creative nonfiction, dialogue, intimate details, conducting successful interviews. And then throughout the course of the semester, students write three creative essays. And we get together and we critique them. We talk about what's working, why, what might work better, and how the students might, the things that students might change in order to have their essays better achieve what I call the aims of the essay. So not what the reader wants it to be about, but what we imagine the writer is aiming for in the act of putting these words on the page. So it's a lot of fun. And the students are really... It's, I'm at the end of the semester, and it's fantastic to see the amount of growth that goes on in three short months. Um, you're at Brown, so I guess you're a bit spoiled with your students. Not only <laughs> are these really good students, it's an Ivy League, but at the same time, it's my understanding Brown sort of attracts the more eclectic Ivy League type. So it must be fun for you. Absolutely. I mean, we're also 
I think as everyone knows in this moment of incredible, I think, soul searching in academia and um, thinking about who gets access to what kinds of education and where. And Brown has been pretty proactive in trying to attract students from all different parts of the world, but also all different socioeconomic groups. So they just started, I think, this year with a pledge that says that no student will graduate from Brown with debt, I believe. So they're really doing a lot to pull in a really diverse student body into the classroom. So I've also been enjoying that. And I was also thinking, you know, along the lines of thinking about uh, environmentalism in writing, I also teach an advanced seminar where students interview folks living in Rhode Island whose lives and livelihoods are being changed by climate change. Oh, wow. And then they turn those interviews, they transcribe them, they edit out, let's say, like 80, 85 percent of the language that the person used so that what you get is this really neat sort of pared down monologue completely in the voice of the interviewee. And we just compiled a bunch of those um, particular to a group of fishermen working in the Narragansett Bay and shared them at a at a Sea Grant NOAA conference here. So there's also definitely like an environmental component to some of my more advanced classes, which has been fun as well. Okay, I've, I've got big ambitions for this podcast. So I want to ask you a couple more questions about the students. But first off, just the basics. And I think I know what it is, but I, maybe not all our my listeners is what is creative nonfiction? <laughs> Great question. It is. It can take many different shapes and forms. That's a term that has risen in popularity. I think sort of it came on the heels of gonzo journalism in the 60s. And I would say that it's a kind of nonfiction writing where you often get the author involved in the text in some way. There's often a first person I, and that person is somehow usually a guide through the events that are being recalled. That doesn't mean it can't be historical, but you'll often include bits about what it means to encounter a particular set of information in the library. And then you might go in this journey back in time to talk about DEET or other aspects that you're researching, but you're always often part of the story, not 100% of the time, but that's usually a good marker to tell if it's creative nonfiction or not. Okay, so I'll admit, in my own homework for this episode, creative nonfiction, you have things like biography or autobiography, memoir, travel writing, food writing, and I think those touch upon what you just described there, and my question is just more of, are we at the stage yet where we could even give adaptation a category, or is it still too new? That's a great question. I think I wouldn't often just strictly call it adaptation, but I do think about and I teach an essay progression called the new nature writing. And um, when students work on that essay prompt, we often go back and look at some of the old stuff like Thoreau and some of the real uh, defining voices of nature writing in the United States. And then we ask ourselves, you know, what does it mean to be writing about nature in this particular moment in time. And often the result will be a piece on some form of adaptation. And I think that that's, there's also just this, I think, push to get the sciences into nature writing in a way that hasn't been a historical, like defining marker of the genre. So that's exciting. Okay. I'm not gonna let you off the hook here. I, okay. <laughs> I, I, I want us to come to, a conclusion here where we come up with a new category and I agree adaptation is sort of a clunky and it, a lot of people won't, won't like that. But when you see something travel writing, food writing, it says so much and people get it. And so what I mean, nature writing, I think you're you're putting climate adaptation in a box. It doesn't necessarily need to be in nature writing. I mean, it, it affects the you know built mm. environment in ways that you know, I would even necessarily align with nature writing and climate adapting or whatever. But I mean, it to me, that next phase is that first. I mean, you've done it yourself with the writing that I've read. It's just you're there in the middle of talking about these issues. It needs a name and you might not be able to come up with it right now, but I want it to be alongside these things. Because because that's, I think, in its own way, will attract people. People, you know, read things based on just even brief descriptions. Good point. And I feel like 
I completely agree that putting it in the nature category can certainly be misleading. And I think that a lot of times when uh, we think about nature, quote unquote nature, it's often sort of something outside of human experience. It's the wilderness. It's like over there and separate from us. And I think that there is also a lot of awareness in writing that thinks about the earth and earth systems to discuss nature in such a way that human beings are part of that term in a way that hasn't historically always been considered the case. I feel like sometimes I worry, and I'm curious what you think about this. You know, we just batted around a subtitle for my book, Rising, for months, and there was talk about you know, a subtitle that was reckoning and resilience along the American shore and adapting along the American shore. And I do sometimes feel like people are already fatigued by some of those terms that we hear them so often that they've stopped being super useful markers. And I'm curious if you found that, I mean, I know your podcast is called America Adapts and I think it's awesome. But I'm curious if you sometimes feel a fatigue around the terms that we use to discuss these issues. Oh, great question. Yes and no. And in the yes part, it's people like us hanging out with each other and the workshops that we attend and the conferences that we go to. And our universe is actually quite tiny. And I think if you just step outside a little bit of that universe, I mean, these are all very new terms to people and even right. people who are dealing with conservation. There's a lot of training going on right now, and I'm shocked at the lack of knowledge on just basic climate terms and, you know, climate tool kits and things like that. And so I think we really have a, a long way to go to really penetrate some of these terms in a way that I think the public will find useful. And I guess I had a question that it lends itself to this r really quickly. I was going to ask you, because just in what you're doing, the term resilience is used a lot and it's used, you know, as, as planners use it, it's really become the favorite term. And I think the previous administration, they really relied on resilience and how they approach climate change. And I hate it. If you listen to my podcast, I go out of my way just to smother that term as often as <laughs> I can. I, I mean, it's just, it's, I think it misleads the public on what you're trying to accomplish. And in some cases, it's the right term, but you go to some of the workshops that you go to, you'll ask 10 people to give the, you a definition on resilience, and they'll have 10 different definitions. And the, the worst problem – here I am pontificating. I'll let, <laughs> I'll let you step in in a second here. But it's just resilience gives that false impression that you have more control over the situation than you do. Oh, we're just going to climate-proof this coastal system. Right. And it's like, well, no, actually you might have to let some of these systems go. And that your book that's coming out next year, you know, I'm reading some of the excerpts from that. It's just about Miami. It's like – you are going to have to give up. And when you focus on resilience, I think you give people false assurance that you have more control over the, the, the system. And as a writer, I'm curious your thoughts. What, what do you think of resilience? Well, that's another great question. I think, I mean, something that I think about a lot is whether or not real resilience might be learning to let go of some of the places that we love. Yes. Um, and I do, I completely agree that there are a million different definitions for resilience and what qualifies for, you know, amplifying resilience for a particular species of hummingbird isn't going to amplify resilience for a particular species of salmon, isn't going to work for what's going to work in Staten Island, isn't necessarily going to work in uh, rural Louisiana. And so there is, I think... I also would completely agree that it's misleading because it sort of gives us the sense that we can come up with a technological fix. And I would say that a lot of my writing looks at the science behind climate change and then also really tries to ask what's the lived human experience in the places that are on the front edges of the changes that are already taking place in the environment. So in my mind, resilience is also a kind of emotional resilience and figuring out that we as human beings have the emotional capability and capacity to adapt and to change our ideas of who we are and what we do and where we belong. And I think in some ways, my work tries to highlight 
that, which is also another form of resilience. But I think were I to call it like resilience literature, people would have a really different expectation of what they might find in there. And I will say another one other thing that jumps to mind is I was talking to a conservation biologist and ecological historian in the San Francisco Bay recently. And he was saying, you know, the San Francisco Bay used to have 30 miles of sandy beach and that's all gone. That beach has all disappeared over the past century. And a lot of in the places where the marshes of San Francisco Bay have been the most able to weather and adapt to changes in the bay were places that it turns out historically had a kind of skirt beach along the front of them that helped buffer them in storm events and slowed erosion. And so the way he described resilience was thinking about how do you build landscape resilience? It's like having a palette and you're a painter and you want to be able to have as many different colors on your palette as possible in order to try out different solutions in the built environment to see what might actually make it into the next century. And so for him, resilience was sort of keeping as many options on the table as possible. And sometimes that even meant looking back, you know, a hundred years ago and saying, are we just because it doesn't, we don't have skirt beaches today. Maybe that doesn't mean that we shouldn't put them on the palette of potential solutions and interventions that might help some of our coastal ecosystems adapt. And I thought that was pretty smart. I'm so lucky to have the guest that I do. I'm sitting there going resilience bad. And you're here. <laughs> how you explained that was just wonderful. I, that was really a great way to explain. So the controversies around it and the shortcomings of it. So no, I appreciated that. So I'm going to do a massive pivot right now because there, okay. we're, we're going to come back to some of these topics, but you're an author, you're a writer, and I, I want to share some of this. Uh, obviously we can't share that much, but how I want to do this is we're not going to give really much context. This is a piece you wrote, something like Vertigo, and I sent you, I think it's three paragraphs that if you could read, and then when you're done, we'll go in and give a little bit more context of what that larger piece was about. So, But let's go ahead and have you just read it. Okay. So this is an excerpt from something like Vertigo. My father is a man of little patience. Little patience on the telephone with his personal banker. Little patience for poorly manufactured plastic gadgets. Little patience for those who cannot step far enough away from the immediate moment to imagine the impact of their actions on the longevity and health of a complex system. His growing understanding of ecological collapse meant that the longer he stayed in real estate, negotiating contracts with Dunkin' Donuts, Perfume Mania, and Verizon, the more he became the kind of person for whom he had little patience. The longer he stayed, the lower his patience reserves dipped. My father's illness has absolutely nothing to do with the science of climate change, and the science of climate change has nothing to do with physical flips or tips. And yet we describe both phenomena with similar language. One is vertical and the other is horizontal, but both depict the moment when the body is suddenly lost in space. I'm interested in the alchemy of issues, for an issue is what climate change has become, and I fear that it'll get stuck there in the untethered and abstract space that surrounds many of our most pressing and deeply politicized concerns. I'm interested in how to make climate change tangible, how we might transmute it into something we can taste and touch and see. Can the disorientation that accompanies my father's vertigo somehow become the disorientation that comes with sea level rise? How did hating his job become environmental? How did aging become hating his body? And isn't it all really just about fearing what we do not know? Okay, fantastic. I, I love those pieces. And uh, when I was reading the, the overall piece, if, if you want to give a bit more context about this, the link between climate change and your father, go ahead and do that. Just because these three pieces were taken at different parts of the overall essay. So they weren't one after the other if there were, it didn't seem logical to folks. Sure. So my, where to begin? My father came down with a, a disease. We didn't know what it was. Um, where he was really, really, really dizzy. It happened to him suddenly. His mo my mom and I, his mom, blah, my mom and him 
were in Montreal traveling together and he just woke up in the middle of the night and his entire world was spinning. And to be honest, that was over two and a half years ago and he still suffers from dizziness. We don't know what's caused it, um, but it fundamentally changed the way he inhabited the world. This one, it was like one of the laws, like the law of gravity changed just a little bit. And everything he did in his body had to change as a result to reckon with that subtle shift that he experienced. And at the time, I was writing a lot about sea level rise and wondering and spending a lot of time in communities that are already, you know, flooding quite regularly. And I thought to myself, in some ways, what's happening to them? They're sort of losing set of ideas and physical spaces that they used to navigate by and towards and through. Um, I thought that that was in some ways maybe not all that different from my father's, the onset of this, you know, strange and sort of inexplicable illness. And I wanted to find out what both could tell me about the other circumstances. And I think in more, more particularly, I wanted to see if the way my father dealt with that shift um, and one of the fundamental laws that sort of governed his universe, if we might be able to apply some of the integrity and adaptation that he did in order to live with this disease, how we might think about applying that to what it means to live in a world where the seas are rising. I love the piece. And it actually isn't that long. I think it's like five to seven pages. And it, to me, creating, you, you had to sit there and think that what you, what you just described, this sort of the narrative device of, you know, your father's situation and then sea level rise. And I thought that was really brilliant. And I'm curious, how did your father react to the piece? Oh, that's a great question. He said to me very recently, as I was describing another piece that is maybe perhaps a tiny bit more controversial, he said to me, I know what it's like to be turned into a metaphor. So <laughs> um, he's always been a huge support of my writing and of my of my work. And I think finding himself in the pages of that work was also perhaps a little bit disorienting. But in the end, I think he appreciated the overall product, if that makes sense. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, well, well sure. And, and obviously, you don't learn a lot about your father from the piece, but some of the way you describe his, his job and everything, and I think he is actually that good metaphor of America. He's a bit cantankerous at times and a, a little <laughs> difficult at times. And I'm sitting there going, yes, that's that's America. And I think at the end of the day, wants to do the right thing and wants to adjust. But uh, I thought, you know, he <laughs> represented the struggle we're, we're undergoing right now and we'll have to deal with. So, no, I thought that was quite good. And I guess where the piece fell short for me is I wanted that next chapter, not only for him, but for you know sea level rise and you don't you don't have the answers i get that but how can as a, a writer focusing on what you do start to sort of write about those things and how are we addressing it and so i guess that's where i was like i want more and but i don't think you, you didn't have the you didn't you, you can't look in the future so well i appreciate that and i feel like in a funny way I people ask me how long I spent writing the book that it, that's coming out next year, Rising. And my answer is always five years. And the first two and a half years, I think I spent a lot of time writing much more traditional nonfiction about sea level rise that was pretty science forward and lacked some of these like larger overarching metaphors. And actually this piece was the first thing that I wrote that I think really took a step back and asked not just what's happening in our coastal communities, but how are we learning to make sense of it? And I feel like in some ways something like Vertigo is actually the piece that sparked the book that's coming out next year, because everything I've written since then, I think, is much more in this style. And it felt like a turning point that I learned how to write about sea level rise in a way that was fundamentally different from what I saw, you know, appearing in a lot of the pages of the newspaper magazines that I most respected and 
something like vertigo felt like a sort of aha moment to be sure. Well, that's, that must be just exciting for you to have a catalyst to help you as you start writing more on the subject. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's also hard. I mean, yeah, when you do a long sort of overarching metaphor throughout a piece, it, I think, is a much less straightforward writing process. So uh, you have to sort of learn to trust your instinct, and that can be scary at times. All right. So going back to a little bit of what we talked about before, adaptation, I I, we, I think we both agree it's just such a boring word to, to use. It's, it doesn't capture the, the, the public's imagination. And other terms in climate change like resilience and risk management, these are very boring. And so what, I try to, <laughs> <laughs> so I, what, I, what I'm trying to do with this podcast is to make this issue more accessible and I guess something to get more excited about. And, and a message that I bring up frequently is that adapting to climate change will be the greatest challenge – humanity has ever faced. And I honestly believe that, you know, people think of what about these wars and such. And it's like, if you get familiar with the science, even just a little bit, you what's coming in the pipeline is a pretty big deal. And I, I don't like to be pessimistic, but it's just, it's this big challenge. And why is it so hard to come up with some compelling narratives around this subject? And, mm. and to me, it's, it's adaptation and you don't have to use the term adaptation, but it's like, we're about to undergo this journey to adapt <laughs> and it's going to yeah. be, there's going to be highs and lows and we don't know what some of those lows are going to be. And we need more writers sort of capturing our imagination on this. And I mean, why is it so hard? Well, I think the number one reason why it is really hard is just that the things that we're doing to fundamentally change the earth's climate are completely unprecedented in geologic history they also still are happening on a time scale that is very hard for human beings to pay attention to. And I remember reading something that said, you know, most human beings are keenly aware of their grandparents' generation, their parents' generation, their own generation, and their children's. And anything beyond, let's say, that like 100-year maybe it's a little bit longer swath of time, it's pretty hard for us to reckon with. And so when someone tells us that sea levels are currently rising significantly faster than they have in the past 3,000 years and that we've warmed the planet or put more carbon into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than there has been in like something like 200,000 years, those things are just very hard for us to register. And the difference between 200 years and 200,000 years in this bizarre way isn't that much, I think, for our limited, narrow human perspective. So I think that's really one of the biggest fundamental issues. I think the other is that it feels very real when you live on the front edge, the front edge of some of those changes. But our lives, especially in the United States, are pretty well buffered from some of the most immediate impacts of climate change, though I would argue that 2017 has been a real watershed year for people to start to wake up to the fact that changes in the planet are impacting their daily lives now. Two or three years ago, it was just hard to point to any particular aspect of your life unless you were a farmer working through, you know, record-breaking drought or a fisherman trying to pull lobster from a bay where the temperatures have risen three degrees, um, unless your life brought you into an immediate contact with, quote unquote, the natural world or the environment, it's pretty easy to feel like it's not actually happening. <laughs> and I think we also live in our screens now, which is another way in which our lives are sort of removed from the the spaces in which these changes are taking place. So all of those things, I think, make it hard to experience and hard to write about in turn. Okay. And then I'm going to take the contrarian view again on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree. I think when you're there, I think some great stories are coming out of Miami, people who are living on the front line. But I, I guess I want to use my dad in, in this example is you have people living in Kansas or North Dakota that when you start talking about threats like ISIS or, you know, they, they, they vilify mm. certain er terrorist groups that these people are arming themselves. They're going out and they're just constantly scared. And, you know, I things like Fox News play a large role in 
scaring them, but they're they're creating a narrative that's obviously quite effective. My my own dad, he's considering getting like a concealed weapon. He li- <laughs> he lives in this absolutely safe, nice community in Florida, and I'm I'm like, why are you, do you need a weapon, Dad? And he doesn't really have a good answer for me. But he, they watch these things and they get scared, and so. I don't want to necessarily scare people that way, but they're creating narratives that resonate, that people act upon. And what is that sort of like, how do you thread that needle on the climate change side to really take those, you know, cues with the narrative? So I think for me, sometimes what, how I try to think about doing that in my own writing is to, for instance, um, ask a scientist who works on climate change. I think we have to get away from having scientists just share their, their narrative in a set of numbers. It's like we have these really abstract terms like parts per million and carbon sequestration. And I think those are terms that the general public, as you mentioned, doesn't have a real entry point with. And so I think it's also really important to think about how do you translate that really important scientific knowledge into a language that someone who might not have a training or background in the hard sciences could use and access? And so sometimes I talk to people about, okay, you're a scientist, you have this knowledge. How is that impacting the decisions you make in your personal life? And I was just talking to an Arctic scientist and she said, <laughs> She was like, I'm, I'm not going to have children. Like, I genuinely don't know that the world that they would live in would have a stable social net for them to exist inside of safely. And she's like, I can't, I don't actually believe that I can bring a child into this world. So I try to access that kind of thinking alongside of some of the more specific and idiosyncratic language that people often use to talk about these issues. Yeah, this is a tough one. And one of the questions I had for you is that I, I, I'm dusting off my, you know, I actually got an undergrad in creative writing. And oh, cool. Let me just be upfront. I'm a terrible writer. I just, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was my way to quickly graduate it. from college. Uh, oh, what can I do to the quickest? And so, but you look at things and I think this is applicable to, uh, creative nonfiction too. It's not just fiction writing. As you, you look at Joseph Campbell's, the Campbell, Campbell's, uh, hero journey, right? Famous. Everyone looks at him. This is how you could break down storylines. What are these basic narratives that people use to create a great story? And how could that apply broadly on the issue of adapting to climate change or even on, on a smaller scale? But there are narrative tools and devices that resonate with the public that aren't, it's not rocket scientists. They've been there and people keep distilling. Why does this Hollywood movie flop? And this one does really well. Well, ultimately it's a story and you have characters people care about. And so I, yeah, is that come into play when you, in your courses with your students, things like, you know, the, the hero's journey, that basic storytelling technique? Yes, absolutely. That's interesting. Let me think. We certainly talk about, I would say I know what you mean with the hero's journey. And I think that's often been like a marker of travel writing, for instance, like the the individual goes out into the world to discover something. And then that knowledge changes them as a result. I think that one thing that I work on is also asking if that's a traditional narrative technique, how can we use it in new and exciting ways? So one prompt that I have that's really built around that idea of the hero's journey is what if we wrote a story like that, but instead of the place that we're venturing to being the Alps or India or somewhere quote unquote exotic, what if it was your backyard or, you know, I'll say like a marsh down the street. What if you actually use that narrative to try to discover a place that you would often overlook? And that might prompt a student or prompt me or anyone really to, let's say, take a journey to your landfill, take a journey to the local center that controls all the bus routes in your city. And I think if we can sort of turn that level of curiosity and inquiry in towards the spaces that we inhabit every day, 
that also gives us a way of perhaps making adaptation or recognition and reckoning with climate change into something that is more approachable and exciting. So I think you definitely can take that hero's journey and apply it to writing about climate change and the environment. Well, I think of a large macro story that oh, you writers out there, this is a challenge for you. You look at the Paris Agreement, you know, the climate change Paris Agreement. That doesn't get enough credit for being this sort of monumental effort that all these countries came together really to save the planet. It, it really is this amazing story, but it gets caught up in the wonky. Of, right. There are these meetings and these numbers and it's, oh, they borify it so quickly. And then along comes Trump. And he pulls out and there, there's a classic sort of hero's journey moment. It's like a step back, you know, there, there's an obstacle and the story's still being written. It could still really end very badly. Is there going to be sort of the redemption moment, you know, a future president four years from now, eight years from now, where they come back into that Paris agreement in, in a much more profound way? And I hope that kind of story can be written. And again, how do you lend that self to like a book or a narrative? But th there are these moments out there. And I just I feel like you need that creativity to kind of bring those down to earth in a way to resonate. Because I, again, I feel like the Paris Agreement, it was it really was one of those great moments mm. in human history. And it's it doesn't is not really portrayed that way by the news media. I agree completely. I said to my husband, when the Paris Agreement was signed, I was just like, what other moment in human history have we all come together to agree on anything like that is absolutely an incredible accomplishment. And it filled me with chills for like a long time. I was awesome. really excited about the signing of the Paris Agreement. And I think for all those reasons, it's also really frustrating to have the United States pull out and at the same time, you know, heartening to see that other countries aren't following our lead. Thank God. You know, it makes me certainly feel like a pariah, <laughs> a pariah nation to be sure. But I think you're right. I mean, I think we need storytelling to, to make these, to make these stories really engaging and exciting for a broader audience. I'm trying to think of who. I've really enjoyed some of the writing of Craig Childs. I'm just trying to think of what are, who are the other writers that I think tell the climate change narrative in a really engaging and new way. He has a book called Apocalyptic Planet, where he ventures to seven different really extreme landscapes that already exist. You know, the, uh, the Sonora Desert, for example. I want to say the Atacama Desert, but that's not right. It's the Sonora Desert. Um, and he imagines sort of the world ending by fire. And then he journeys to a bunch of glacial covered mountains in Patagonia and imagines the world ending by the slow deterioration of glaciers the world over. And it's a book that has every bit of the adventure story in it. But that also, I think, inadvertently slips the hard science about climate change in through the back door. And I think it does a really good job of that. Well, the example here, and, I, and I'm using a fiction book, but I thought it was useful. And ha have you read it, the, the Martian, that very popular book? Did you read, ever read that? I haven't. That, that's okay. It's not. It's, it's probably not your company. It's a Damon movie. Also, oh, right, right, right. right. Yes, did you Did yes. you see the movie? I did see the movie. Yes. <laughs> okay. I love the movie, and I ended up reading the book too. And so I think the author would be the first one to admit he he's not a literary author and it's a piece of fiction but he he attempted to do everything that was based in the real world of science when he wrote that book so all the things that they would do that's the sort of the boundaries that he had and i thought that was great very clunky writing but it was still a page turner because you, yeah. you get caught up with this one individual and even with the movie you saw the movie it's just you got so excited about the role of nasa and what are we capable of with humanity and so i to me it even though it's a fiction book, I thought that is a, potentially like a, sort of a useful model of like, you know, we, we can do this. We can bring some science and just really distill it down and to get people exciting about rallying around something. So, yeah. Well, that makes me think last year I taught a class called Cli-Fi, which was climate change science fiction. Yes, yes. And I, I am not a science fiction nerd. But I have seen, you know, a fair number of really solid creative nonfiction writers turn to this genre. 
and their readership would often just like explode. So it's, you know, the straight nonfiction pieces that they're writing might get read by a couple thousand people, but they're cli-fi books like, holy cow, bestsellers topping out on the Amazon top 100 or whatever. And a lot of them, the way I taught the class was to think about, you know, how, how fundamentally informed are they by the science that we know around climate change? And I think each book has a different relationship to the hard science that sort of sparked it. But there are ones that have, you know, the writers took incredible care to make sure that the hard science that informs their books is spot on. And so you get these stories of Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140, which imagines a New York City about 120 years in the future, where half of the island is underwater. And he shows all of the different ways in which class struggle remains and continues to define the city. And also different like speculative financial instruments start to morph and adapt to the uncertainty that comes with having like intertidal real estate. And I think he presents like a very compelling vision of the future that's not wholly apocalyptic, though it isn't necessarily bright and cheery either. And it's deeply informed by real climate science. So there's a couple of books out there that are like that, that I really like as well, and that students really engage with. Well, funny you mentioned Cli-Fi. I was going to ask you about that. I actually like the name Cli-Fi. Some people don't like it. I think it perfectly gets you where you need to go on what, what they're covering. But I actually did an episode around Cli-Fi. Do you happen to know Amy Brady? Did that name her? Anybody else? No, but I should. I she, should. She's a literary critic for the Chicago Book Review. And she, I think she's based in New York, though, actually. She would probably make a great guest speaker in one of your courses. And that's her thing is is she does Cli-Fi. And she came on and she talked about some of those books that you just mentioned. And just, you know, the, sort of the history of it and what's going on with the field. And it was really a kind of a fun episode. But uh, that's her. She runs a blog where she kind of digs into the new books that come out. So, uh, yeah, I highly recommend you maybe connect with her, Amy Brady. I awesome. Could, I, could put, I could put you in touch with her. She's really great. That would be amazing. I think I was really intimidated to teach the class. And now that I've done it once, I think, OK, I could I could do that again. So she would be a great guest for sure. Well, Thank and, you. I, and I think she'd be very interested to know that you're even teaching this course. I think she tries to keep her finger on, like, how is this genre really kind of growing? So that would be Brown toasting a Cli-Fi course. I think that'd be interesting to her. So. Fabulous. Yeah. When I put together the syllabus, it was like there was absolutely no model. And I just spent like six months reading a ton of cli-fi. And there were moments where my husband would look at me and be like, you need to stop reading that because like <laughs> all of, most of those stories don't end well. And you're like getting a little depressed. <laughs> uh, I, I'm with you. I'm not a big sci-fi fan. I just I don't have patience for fiction. I just uh, I just can't do it. So, I mean, it's your job, though. You have to. <laughs> it's my job. Yeah. There were moments where I was like, why did I want to teach this class? But mm. I'm glad. I am very glad that I did. This has been an awesome conversation. I, I have a few more questions. I, I think we've covered a lot of ground, but I, I guess getting back to, I guess, your motives in what you do. And so as you're tackling these issues of climate change, it occurred to me that, you know, you're a writer, but you might have a short term goal with a particular piece. But are there sort of larger goals that you have? Are you just secretly a, a climate advocate and you want people to act on it? based on your writing and that's your way of doing it. I mean, what's your incentive for what you're doing? That's a really good question as well. There are many ways that I could answer it. Um, the most interesting one, please. Go the with that most one. interesting <laughs> one. I think, I mean, I think the one that's like maybe like most pertinent and the question about like sort of writing and activism is that as I started writing about coastal communities that really are, adapting and coming to terms with sea level rise. Many in more rural parts of the country, I think felt from the extensive time that I spent in them that they were facing a lot of these challenges on their own. And in like the most basic and most immediate sense, the reason I wanted to write the book in the way that I did was that I wanted to bring all of these experiences into a conversation with one another. And I very much felt that my work was iterative as I was doing it, that, you know, one of the 
earliest communities that I wrote about was the Isle de Jean Charles in Louisiana. And at that time, they were petitioning the Army Corps of Engineers and trying to organize for the Corps to help them relocate in as a group. Um, but they had been unsuccessful in two earlier petitions. And as I started to look, move to other coastal communities, write about other coastal communities, um, in the United States, I was able to share contact information and say, you know, you're not alone in this. You should really get in touch with, you know, Albert Nanquin, the, the current tribal chief of the Biloxi, Chittimacha, Choctaw Native Americans who live on this island because he's done a lot of the paperwork to work on getting and securing funds for relocation. And so that it felt like amongst that I was sort of, I was an information sharing point amongst and between these different coastal communities. I think what's also really exciting to me right now is that I'm starting to see in particular in the wake of the 2017 hurricane season, uh, information sharing networks really based around citizen advocacy for mitigation, uh, resilience and adaptation to flood risk sprouting up all around the country. And I just became aware of this really cool group called Flood Forum USA that is actually bringing the presidents or people in charge of those various citizen uh, flood concern communities together to brainstorm and information share. And I think that there really is this like growing momentum and tide around on the ground responses and ways to advocate and leverage state and federal funding to have to help your community become better prepared for sea level rise. That's really exciting to me. Um, and I hope that my work can be a part of that conversation going forward. Awesome answer. So who are some of your favorite writers right now? Ah, um, who are some of my favorite writers? It's so funny when people ask me that question at the end of the semester, because, of course, the things that I've been reading all right, semester right. long are all the things that I've assigned. And I just went out to my local bookstore and bought two new books last night to read over break. But of the things that I assigned and read this past semester, real standouts for me are I'm deeply enamored with the work of Eula Biss. I think that she's a fantastic creative nonfiction writer and she writes largely about race and white privilege in the United States, but in a way that sidesteps, I think a lot of the name calling and judgment that often defines some of those conversations and the way that they're um, taking shape. So she, I think just for, just for the, this is going to sound sort of cheesy, but just the depth of her humanity on the page, as well as her intelligence, I think she really blows me away. Hmm. Others that I really enjoyed reading. And I'll, I'll, and yeah, I'll, I'll, I was just gonna say, I'll include like, if you give me two or three names, I'll include sort of links to some of their work on my show notes too. So people can explore more. Oh, awesome. Um, in which case, no, I'm going <laughs> to advocate for also Angela Palm. She just won something called the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize. That's, uh, I don't know if you know this publisher, Grey Wolf. They actually publish Ulibis as well. They're just, I think, really, they have their finger on the pulse of some of the most exciting creative nonfiction and poetry that's being made in the country right now. Um, she just won their Grey Wolf Nonfiction Writing Prize, and hers is a memoir. I think the subtitle is called A Memoir, Riverine, A Memoir from Anywhere But Here. And I hadn't expected it, but it's also, it's a book sort of about what it means to live in a low-income community that is regularly reshaped by flooding, but uh, this doesn't take place in the coast. It takes place in the center of the country. And how I think that everyday violence sort of bleeds into and shapes her life and the lives of her neighbors. So one of her closest friends growing up, I think goes on to be committed of murder. And uh, it 
the book in this one way is like a kind of it's a new kind of nature writing, a meditation on a very particular place in one's relationship to it and how it shapes the people who live there. I thought it was excellent. What else? Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I just it, it like push me in any direction in particular, like uh, no, creative nonfiction or environmental or it, it's just your answers are. I mean, they're fabulous and people are going to love them. And it just occurred to me how dumb I really am sometimes. And just <laughs> what I read versus what you read. And it's just I get exposed to this. So I, I think that's great. No, I, 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 these books. I mean, they're awesome, but it's also, yeah, it's, I read so deeply in my niche. Like I'm yeah, all yeah. about creative nonfiction. And I just had a friend say to me like, oh, have you read this, you know, this new novel? And it's like, no, I, I, other than my foray into cli-fi, like fiction is not really on my radar. So, you know, I think everyone has their own little, the box that they're best at exploring. That's all. Well, no, don't be defensive. You're, you're dealing with <laughs> someone who, who, who reads between, you know, I'll, I'll, I like to read science and then I'll read maybe a comic book. It's just my taste are just juvenile in some ways. And so it's just, it's, I, I get exposed to uh, some amazing people through this podcast and just uh, your, your own work and the work that you're exposed to. I just find it, it's nice for me to get exposed to more of that. So. Well, thank you. I'm curious, what's your favorite science book of last year? Ooh, of last year. Um, uh, or two years, <laughs> recent science book. You know what I thought was one of the greatest science books ever written, and even my like 11 year old son wrote it, read it, and got a lot out of it was uh, Bill Bryson's uh, History of Nearly Everything. And oh, cool! He, he Bill Bryson, you familiar? You know, A Walk in the Woods. Yeah. He's a famous writer, and there you go. That's my style book. But he took a deep dive on a lot of science issues, like how the cell operates, astronomy, and so he covers like all these major science. And this book is like 10 years old now, but he it it was really just a fascinating way of like, maybe how would a layman really dig into a science subject? And I thought that was fabulous. And you know what? I, I find like, I don't read science books as much as I, I should. And now that I've got this podcast, it's really been interesting. People send me their books. I'll have publishers send me books and I'm like, Oh man, when am I going to read that? book? <laughs> I got like two or three books within like a couple days of the, I'm like, Oh, I don't wow. know. about. And it's, yeah, it's for you. You probably blow through a book in two days it takes me six weeks to read a book um <laughs> it's just terrible and right now i'm reading i go back to old books i'm reading the the biography um of einstein the mccullough version of it oh and it's just you know it's i love that kind of stuff that kind of science quantum stuff and so that that's what i'm reading right now um fascinating <laughs> I th we've covered so much ground here. I just have a couple more questions for you. And um, first off, just for your your, your sake, you, you've got this book coming out. Could you give a little details about that if people – something to look forward to? Sure. So it is – I like to describe it as an on-the-ground investigation of seven different coastal communities that are already responding to sea level rise. Um, but what's really different about it is that each – place that I profile, um, it opens with a monologue written entirely in the voice of the person, a person that lives in that community. So some of that storytelling technique that I was telling you about that I teach my students um, in the testimonial storytelling class that I teach, I use that in this book. And so, for instance, the chapter that is about small working class coastal community in New York City on Staten Island that came together to petition the state to buy to buy and bulldoze all of the homes in their coastal community. Um, and they did this successfully in the wake of Sandy. That chapter opens with a monologue in the voice of a woman whose father died during the storm. And she tells the story of the day before and the day of Sandy and the search for his body and how they eventually found him and really talks about that being a catalyzing moment for the community that three people actually in their community passed away during the storm. And they had been living with recurrent flooding that was getting worse and worse um, in more recent years, but they were, you know, sited on top of a former wetland. So it's not a surprise that they would flood. And 
the community came together and said, you know what, we don't want to live here anymore. And so the chapter opens with probably 4,000 words in her voice. And I think that is part of what this book really does well and differently is to centralize the voices and experiences of actual people um, who are living with climate change now and to make them part of the conversation. And I think in that way, attempts to think about how we can all hold ourselves responsible for thinking through and funding and making possible on the ground resiliency and adaptation for folks all across this country, because it is starting to impact people now. Okay, just so you sent me like a draft, and I didn't read the entire part of it, but I read the the Florida chapter. So I, let me have this right, is that you were actually doing all the writing. So it, you had, I think, Dan Lipkiss or something. And so you yeah, were- Yeah, Dan Kipnis. Kipnis. And so you were writing on his behalf, or that wasn't his words, that was you writing for him. No, those were all his words. Okay, okay, um, okay. So yeah, you got it right. Um, that's the result of like three hours of interviews Got it. that then I transcribe and you, I mean, you know, you're an interviewer, like three hours of interviews leads to, I don't know, 20 pages, single spaced of text. And then my job, I think of myself, not really as the author of that, but as a compiler or an editor. So I go back in and I remove you know, 90% of the language so that one story, one sort of shimmering arc remains. And that story is, those are all his words. I just took out 90% of them. Does that make sense? It did. And it is the one I, I read and it, he was pretty sassy toward the end. I really liked that. So <laughs> it, it was good. Uh, I think people will enjoy that. So I want to, I mean, he talks about, he's a lifelong resident of Miami beach and he talks about the decision that he's come to, to sell his house. I interviewed him two years ago and in the two years since I just had to reach back out to him to get his approval to use his voice in the book. And I said, you know, Dan, is your house sold? And he said, no. And you know, there are now suddenly 15 homes for sale on my block and none of them are selling and we're all sort of stuck here. Um, he was hoping to get out, I think of Miami before the, the property market started to deflate. And I think he feels like he didn't get out in time. He's still there. He's, he's stuck for now. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Final question. And this is what I ask all my guests. If I could have anyone on this podcast that you could recommend, who would it be? Mm, I would recommend two different women both of whom I think were really integral to the writing and research process that uh, informed Rising. The first is a woman named Rebecca Elliott, and she's a professor at the London School of Economics and studies flood insurance reform. I think this is one of the most important issues in the United States today, and it's one of those issues that's insanely wonky and really full, you know, overfull with uh, acronyms. And she's really smart and has, I think, a lot of really important insights about where different kinds of federal flood insurance reform could take us in the future. So I'd re recommend her, Rebecca Elliott. And the other person is Liz Koslov, who's a postdoc at MIT right now, and she studies managed retreat and looks at different coastal communities that are pulling up their roots and moving in. And she thinks of retreat as a, as an adaptation strategy in and of itself. And she's also just a well of knowledge and information and also really great at communicating complicated issues for a general public. So that's who I'd recommend. Awesome. I'll dig around and maybe I can use you as a connection too. So. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to put you in touch with either of them. All right. 
so this has been a fabulous conversation. I, I got to kind of dust off my old creative writing days and <laughs> talk about writing, uh, live vicariously through you. And in my show notes, I'm going to have links. To, you, you have a website that links to a lot of your writing. If people are interested in really digging deep, right? You, you it just did your namesake. It's .net, right? And I'll have that in the show notes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And a link, a link to rising the book pre-order it now. Okay. I, I will have, <laughs> I will have that. I will have all that. That's fabulous. But Thank you so much for, for coming on. I hope we can stay in touch. And, and uh, I, I'm very curious on how you progress in the sort of writing that you do. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Doug. And thanks for your podcast. It's a great contribution. Well, thank you. All right, everyone. Until next time, this is America Daps, the, the climate change podcast. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap to such a fun episode. Thanks to Elizabeth Rush for joining me on the podcast. Don't forget her book, Rising, Dispatches from the New America Shore, will be out in June. But you can pre-order. Just check it out on Amazon. There's a link in the show notes. I'm very encouraged that writers like Elizabeth are emerging to tell climate stories that are relevant to a broader swath of the public. It's going to take as much creativity as we can muster to get these ideas to penetrate into the public to take action. We need more voices like this. Some final housekeeping, don't forget to join the Facebook page in the Facebook community group. The group is private, but search for America Daps and ask to join and I'll approve you right away. It's a chance to hear some insider info on the podcast and see what other listeners are sharing on the wall. Some great conversations have come out of that group. And I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. Seriously, it's the highlight of my week hearing from you, and sometimes it leads to really cool things. Again, I'm at americadapts at gmail.com. Send me an email. All right, check out the website at americadapts.org. All this information is in my show notes, especially the link to the donate page. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.